Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Well, hello, and welcome to uh, this week's Painting of the Week, which is a painting called Daybreak. This has actually been uh, requested of us, um, and... um, Maybe I'll tell you who in a second because I can't remember. Actually, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure. I knew that it was requested by anybody. Oh, why are we? Doing oh, this one? because it was so well um, received when uh, on the Christmas countdown on your on your page. So every year on our Instagram and mm, Facebook pages, yeah. we do the twelve paintings of Christmas. Yes, or something like that. Yes, and this one got the most likes. Yeah, Maxfield Parish. And it's and it's called Daybreak mm-hmm. by Maxwell Parrish, Maxfield. Yes, Parrish. Yeah, I've got name already. <laughs> and I have absolutely no idea why my colleagues chose this as a Christmas painting because <laughs> it has absolutely nothing, in any form or sense at all, to do with Christmas. Maybe it was giving some people a little bit of winter sun. <laughs> I, so that's completely nonsensical to me from the start. It's so good. Um, but anyway, apparently. Maybe people were ticking it because it wasn't Christmassy. (laughs) Anyway. um, Yeah, maybe people weren't feeling so festive. Now, Mm. surely you all know this by now, but please go to seventh-art.com, our website, and um, uh, go go to the podcast part of the website and you can see the picture for yourself. <laughs> it's an interesting one, <laughs> and um, let's start with something that that we have that has been asserted about this painting, which is that it is the most popular painting in the United States. That it is on one in four walls yeah. in the United States, and is the most popular painting you read of yeah. in the, of the twentieth century. century. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sold in the states for sure. Then, mm. and, yeah. let us take that fact, <laughs> screw it up into a little ball, and mm. throw it in the bin because there's absolutely no way, no, that it's going to be on every fourth wall in the United States. That is total nonsense. So, mm. however, how they how they would come to that fact is beyond me. But. As with all big figures, and this goes right back to ancient history, when people would say, Alexander would say, oh, I was, I was, there were 300,000 men. He didn't mean literally 300,000 men. He just meant there was a big army opposite me. So one in four can't be true. But what it does say is that this was an extraordinarily popular painting. Yeah. And I asked a colleague of mine, a friend and colleague of mine that I'm working with, or that uh, we've been, been, you know, worked together on the Edward Hopper film. I said, "You're American. What's what's the deal with this painting? Is it really?" He said, "Look, I don't believe it's one in four either. But my parents had it on the wall. Did they? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. So, see, that's really interesting. So that 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 sample of one. I think. <laughs> I think what it is though substantiates what we something. Just, what we were saying though is that it's how often does Every time you look at a painting, someone's written, this is the most important painting, this has happened, that has happened. But when it comes down to the general public or, you know, people's homes, what do you eventually put onto your wall? There's also another thing which is... It's very easy for the art world to be completely detached from the real world. Yeah. So um, one of our other podcasts was the, uh, the skating... Vicar. Yes. Well, and the art yeah. world might poo-poo the idea that that's one of the most popular... That is one of the most popular pictures ever. <laughs> that is yeah. on a lot of people's walls. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> and when I, you know, looking back, it's interesting, actually. Just today, it's a bit sad, really, but today I put in the bin a picture. The frame was a bit tatty and it, the picture was faded, but it was a picture that my parents had on their wall. And that was Monet's, it was one. It was a Monet picture of, and it's Monet's wife and child walking through a field of poppies. Okay. Oh, I know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there were certain pictures, but there were certainly kind of some quite, I mean, if, you, if you're 
those of you listening, if you're looking at the picture, this kind of hyper-realistic colour, this kind of, and you were, you were you're going to mention uh, Athena and the posters, which I'm going to come to that later. It's a British. It was well, because British... that's my. I thought it could be embarrassing, embarrassing, but I'm going to. I'm just going to go with it. But I mean, I uh, think in the end, <laughs> I don't know if it's quite so common now, but certainly back in the day, you know, having posters and prints on the wall, mm. and there was definitely well, that period of pretty, pretty garish stuff going on. Well, I, I, okay. Well, I'm going to go straight into this, then, Phil, because I I do think that that is exactly what we need to talk about on this. Is what people actually I this took me right back to when I was 15, sitting in my room, and I started. You know, you you're, you're 15 and you start to sort of decorate your own yeah. that teenage thing, cutting out all the magazines, and the painting that I had on my wall, the print from Athena. I think it was from Athena, which, which we is a so. British British company. Yeah, high high street. Um, every every town had one. They more did than one selling posters, which is then once again selling to the sort of masses as such, isn't it? Yeah. But also, I just said that to you. I also used to work in Woolworths when I was fifteen. Yeah, <laughs> I loved it. And then and they had those ones that you flipped through. Yeah, yeah. So I had a print, a painting, a print called Wings of Love. And that was by Stephen Pearson. Hmm. I looked it up. Hmm. And I thought, I'm going to admit to this. And we said, and when you, if some way, if people want to look at it, obviously, the colours were not far off these colours. And the actual fact, the painting was almost very similar with the oranges, the blues. And it is just one of those things that you put up, another kind of innocent painting that, you know, sort of a little bit of a fantasy. Because the two people in the two, I would say, children in this in this painting are sort of, you know, they're kind of there's an innocence, there's an innocent smile. They look like they're just about to play. It's quite a lovely. It's actually quite a lovely. Painting. So what? So what is going on? What 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 are we seeing well, in this picture? I, I really don't know. I mean, it's it is. He did quite a lot of fantasy images. Mm. So, and it is quite a fantasy image. All right, so we've got two two young women, I guess. Yeah, um, the little one um, overlooking the lady, I'm assuming laying down, they're definitely a girl. Okay, so... He's almost nymph Could it, Could it be a mother and child? Mum's tired? <laughs> Hard yeah. day picking grapes? <laughs> dancing around the pole? This, you know, In a very... <laughs> well... Daughter's just come out of the swimming pool? Yeah. Mum, I'm really hungry. Mm. All right. I don't think it's mother and child. All right, so... When you look closer at the the girl's face. All right, so maybe it's a bit more... Um, supposed to be a bit more, you know, Lord of the Rings, Hobbit kind of fantasy yeah, world. I think so. But she then, looks about 15-ish. So then we have these neoclassical columns, mm. which suggests some kind of fairly fancy building that we're in and, and is behind us. Looking out onto a really quite extraordinary landscape, and as ever, you know, take the time to look. It's it's first time you glance at this picture; it's a bit overwhelming. Stop and pause because mm. when you start looking at the tree, with I mean, I can't imagine there's any tree really like that. So he's just made it up, I think. But I mean the colours and the flat of the flowers quite something but beyond that the rocks and he's done that old trick we've talked about this many times Leonardo was doing it Monet of course planted his garden red in the foreground you know warm colours to the foreground mm -hmm. cold colours in the distance giving you that sense of depth it just tricks the eye the thing that's slightly is that slightly unusual about this is that kind of Band of green. Yeah. Which actually kind of blocks, I think it kind of blocks it a little bit, but actually you very quickly start to think, is that a field? Is it well, slightly it, uh, murky water? Or? I don't know, it looks like poor water to me. But yeah. actually we would, that, there's another thing we would just, we've had a long discussion beforehand today, because finding a painting to represent the colours on Google, on well, no, there are other ones. <laughs> trying to find on the computer, it's been a well, it's tricky. They're all different. All different. So 
is that it's actually quite hard to find a representation of those actual colours, whereas like some of the others we look at, they're, they're pretty easy. They don't mess around with the colours. But in this one, they do. And that green could not, might not actually be re- really green in real life. Hmm. So, so in a second, you can tell us about Maxfield Parish. <laughs> but the thing that's interesting to me, having done Hopper, Mm. Is that he, he does this painting in 1922. Hopper is painting in 1922, not a million miles away from... In fact, there's, there's real similarities. Parrish is, uh, what, 1870 to 1966, mm. and Hopper is 1870... No, 1882 to 1967. Mm. Hopper is basically six months in New York, basically six months in New England. And Parrish is living in New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, which is you know not far. They both work on in illustrating magazines, um, and then they go a slightly slightly different take slightly different paths. But 1922, Hopper is also painting, and he does. Uh, what does he do in 1922? He does um, Cat Boat, I think it's called. Okay. He does um, buy the railway or something like that. He does a anyway. He does some paintings. Why aren't they? Why did they not take off? And I don't know. Suddenly end up in one in four. Yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it, and this one was it not just recreated though so many times and printed? I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. So it must be something to do with the economics of it. Somebody must have picked up on this picture mm. and just made. Mm. I mean, one in four, you're talking about hundreds of yeah. thousands. But, well, we don't accept one in four, but someone's made hundreds of thousands of these prints, shipped them out. So, so maybe in whatever was the main stores of the time, or maybe they were just advertised in magazines. Yeah. You know, how did people buy their prints at the time? Did they actually go to shops and they kind of flick through prints? Or, you know, what you have... What follows very quickly on from the building of the railroads yeah. is an ex, uh, an expansion of the postal service, and the expansion of the postal service allows for a proliferation of magazines. Yes. And magazines bring ideas. And Parrish actually did a lot of illustrations, especially on the covers of magazines. Maybe that's what... And he, he was popular. So his name is... He's got yeah. a name recognition from that. Okay, and that's also interesting. he did a lot of illustrations in books. Magazines. So, yeah. In um, the Artist Garden, American Impressionism, we looked at magazines because um, the changing opportunities and position of women Mm. is partly um, affected by the fact that these magazines are now much more easily distributed. So you've got magazines about home decoration and things like that. We've also got magazines about gardening. We've also got magazines about art. Mm -hmm. And women are saying, no, we're not just going to stay at home and do this, that and the other. And actually these magazines, of which there were many, um, so you would have, you know, monthly monthly delivery. And maybe in the magazine, you know, it would be for so many cents or a dollar or two, you know, you buy buy the print. And maybe because Maxfield Parish had the name, maybe because he knew people within the industry. The other thing, of course, is, you know, and I, I, I can think back to my own parents and the kind of things that we put on our walls. America is, you know, it's going through post-American Civil War. Yeah. 1861, 65. It suddenly has this massive expansion. Plus, you've got millions, I mean, it's millions of, you know, refugees coming in. Oh, right. Immigrants coming in. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of of building going on, a lot of buildings, you know, new. I mean, so many cities are expanding very quickly, apartment blocks. My father lived in apartment blocks in the Bronx. Um, Oh, God, that's a really cool thing to say, Phil. Yeah, I know, it's great. (laughs) It's good. (laughs) Um, I, I'd love to. I'd like. I'd love to go back and see that. It would be amazing to go and see that. Have you been there recently? But it's, it's, okay, this is the strangest coincidence ever. So, I know that my dad and his brother were the last people to leave their apartment in this apartment block, right? Which was had been condemned because there was this guy called Moses, 
who was building the Bronx Freeway Highway, right. <laughs> Highway Freeway, and that, that it was going basically through their apartment. <gasps> Lo and behold, um, the other day I, I went to see a play at a fantastic theatre in London called The Bridge, and I went because we knew that this great actor, Rafe Fiennes, is in it. Oh, yeah. Mm. I actually didn't, I didn't even know what it was about. No. Oh, I think that's the best way to turn it up. Yeah, well, I turned it It's about Moses. It's about this guy. Oh, God, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's quite unbelievable. And yeah. it explained why and the opposition he had and how he overcame it and stuff, why he was trying to build all these straight lines. So he, for example, in the previous week I'd been in New York and I'd, well, I'd go running in the morning and I was running up and down the Hudson on this fantastic boardwalk they built there. Right. <laughs> but but you, you're running up and, up and down this six or eight lane road that he built to get traffic around New York, he built the, the Hudson, um, the freeway goes up the Hudson. Um, and I also had discovered, I also knew that he wanted to build a road that went through Washington Square, mm -hmm. which was what Hopper's studio looked onto, or his, you know, his apartment and studio looked onto. And, and Hopper was clearly against this construction. And in fact, they managed to stop it. And that was in the play as well. The most amazing coincidence. Yeah. And now but, we're here on this. But the point I was making is that I can imagine, and it was true of my upbringing in England, not in America, in England, um, you put a picture like this on because it, it like, you know, instead of having a wall in a fairly bleak apartment block yeah. with maybe mm. a couple of windows looking out, and often those windows might be looking out onto to the brick back wall of another apartment. Yeah. You know, you put something like this up and you are transported. You are. You are transported you are. to mm. to the, in the United States, in, in an American case, you know, you have got the development of the, the state parks at this time too. And people were being encouraged to, you know, visit the amazing landscapes of America. But, you know, if you're stuck in, in downtown New York in the summer when it's hot oh, yeah. and... Anyway... You can understand why someone would put this on. Amazing colour, landscape. Mm, I guess it, it needs beautiful. a it needs a bit of biography, a bit of narrative. You can kind of wonder what's going on. Wouldn't be quite. I mean, it would be slightly odd if there were no. I mean, it feels a bit like a stage. It feels like a theatrical set, and it you know a stage, doesn't it? Well, he was he was actually known for building sets. Ah. To um, yeah, tell me more about. I think Maxfield. he originally studied architecture actually, but he was known for building sets. So instead of going um, so like mountains, you actually would have collected rocks and things like that and built sets and then photographed the sets. And if there was houses in it, he would build a little model of the house. Mm. He then took other photos and, would, and used models in photos, which I believe that sometimes people were saying that he then used a projection system, which sometimes he was, he, they were saying it was sort of cheating a little bit because he projected things and then especially fabric and stuff like that and then sort of copied it but that's all things i've learned so if lovely people wanted to start writing and say so, so we, do in, we think this was a set that was built yeah that would be what they would say about about uh about parish that so, every single painting or paintings the illustrations hmm. he built things to do to do uh does that mean do he's the done paintings? the background first with a little set and those are all little rocks and little bits of yeah. courts or whatever yeah and then he I mean, paints... I'm assuming it wouldn't be exact. Well, maybe it is. But then he, pa then he paints yeah. the characters in. Yeah. And I think, I have read somewhere, maybe you mentioned it, that the, the girl standing up is his daughter. Yeah, they, they are, people say it's based on his daughter, 11-year-old Jean. Mm. So that's why I say, and then they say she's almost nymph-like. Mm. Um, and and the other girl, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know about the other girl, but it is, it is a... It's like it's like you say. You look at the painting, and it's like there's no real story to it. It's up to you to decide what happens. And I'm looking back at when I was 15, 16, and when I started decorating my wall. Why I picked Wings of Love, I don't mm, know. Mm. But there's no. It's up to you then to decide. Whereas some of the paintings we look at, it's it's set in stone what's happening. Mm. So maybe that's why people like it to sit and look at it. And then think, well, something different today might be happening or something like that. But it, the more I look at it, the more I really like it. Mm. But then I was looked at his favourite colour was cobalt blue, 
of which I've given you your coffee in my mm. mug today, which I thought, I think it might be my favourite colour. Mm. And, I mean, it's such a lovely colour, blue, and he always started his paintings with that colour, of which he never mixed his colours, he only layered them. Mm. In, and uh, he layered, got his stipple brush, took it, made, made it dry, took it down, took it down, layered again, then added the next colour, which was nearly always red, and it took weeks and weeks and weeks. Stipple brush took them down, then he added his yellow and stuff like that. So he didn't mix his colours at all, so it's quite an unusual hmm. way of painting. So he's, it took ages, of course. So he's painted this from the back? Yeah, I would imagine so, yeah. Started exactly. I'm not quite sure, and um, people will know, I, I watched this, uh, this guy who was sort of did a demonstration of how he would do his his work, um, how he did all the, I mean, the flowers and stuff. I'm not quite sure how that works. He wasn't really known for, it was always like he had knives and rags and things like that to do his paintings, which was really unusual and not obviously that popular because it took so long. That's why they made the prints of them, probably. There's a bit of a story about him, isn't there, which is that he he had this model mm. and I think the the theory is that his model is originally on the right-hand column mm. there was a third person. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Yeah, and then that person was then painted out, but the third person was the model. And there was rumours about his relationship with his model. Oh, yeah. Uh, and in fact, he he is thought to have had a bit of a menage a trois with his wife in this model, and they kind of lived together. And you know, the neighbours would come by and say, "Come on, hold on, what's going on here?" And he yeah. said, "Nothing, mm. nothing at all, nothing to see here. Move on." Anyway, but I think the theory is that the body lying down is the body of his model. Oh, okay, but the face is a, a woman. I can't remember her name, but Nancy something. Right. And she ends up owning the painting for about 20, 30 years. And then it has a slightly celebrity orientated destination because it gets bought by Mel Gibson's now ex wife, Robin. Oh, okay. <laughs> for $7.2 million, which is the most anyone's ever spent on a Maxfield parish, I believe. Right. Oh, there we are. In 2005, 2006. She then sells it. In 2010, for mm -hmm. $5.2 million. Um, don't quite know where it is now. Um, I... You're right about the, you're right about the model, though. The, his, I think I read that she was his uh, son's nanny. Mm, here we go. Murky. Yeah. <laughs> But when he's, they were together for a couple of years and then his wife found out and left. And they did end up together, but she I think he refused to marry her. Yeah, even at the end. At the right. end, and then she left him. And then yeah. he went on and... I wonder, I don't know. He left, her, he left her the princely sum of $3,000. Really? It's almost an insult. Do you know who he left the rest of his money to? Is it no. children? I don't know. Uh, okay, that's interesting. You see, Hopper's, wife, what, yeah. Hopper's wife was smart, Joe, because mm. she basically said, I will be your model. <laughs> You're not having anyone else. <laughs> so she, so that's she, probably a quite good idea. <laughs> so she was his model for everything. <laughs> and if he, wasn't, if he wasn't content with how she looked, he would change her physical... To airbrush her a bit then. Yeah. <laughs> Which must, I don't know how, I don't know what she would have thought of that. <laughs> but, um, well, maybe she was just knew, knew that she kept her, kept him close. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite funny. Well, no, I, I've not, I didn't come across any, I haven't come across any suggestions that he ever strayed from the path of monogamy, shall we say? Whereas I think Maxfield Parish was perhaps, um, did. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. Allegedly. Who knows? Um, we were talking about um, Edward Hopper's wife, though, weren't we, when we did Painting in the Sun? Yeah, Joe People Niverson, in the Sun. Joe Niverson Hopper, yeah. And then you said when you spoke to um, the lady, the curator, that, their, that their, their relationship was actually quite sweet and nice because when you read about it before, mm. it was always fairly like she was the sort of... Bit cantankerous and stuff, but then the you know it, she said no, it wasn't quite like that. I, I think it's mixed. Right. I think that um, 
I mean, haven't you learned? I've learned you can never judge someone's relationship. No. And you never, you know. No, you definitely can't. And um, sometimes, anyway, this is a relationship that, judging from the diaries, they could be having a blazing row and even get quite physically aggressive with one another. And then two hours later, be going hand in hand to the movies. It's like, hey, how does that work? Um, but there was, um, I think at times he was he was absolutely abusive, Hopper, right. of her. Mm. And there's definitely times when they struck each other. Oh, okay. Um, mm. I, I get the impression that he might lash out first and she would lash back. Oh, right, but okay. they stayed together till the very end and were totally interdependent. Yeah. I think, I mean, no, there's absolutely no excuse for some of the behaviour, but they lived in a, you know, in an apartment, small, cold, had no heating apart from one stove for decades. Right. And then they'd get in the car together. He, he refused to let her drive. So, oh, okay. You know, he would live, physically pull her out from the driving seat. <laughs> really not great. No. But then they would go, they had a house in a place called Truro, which was down a, rutted lane and she wasn't allowed to drive so she was stuck oh yeah right okay and um again i think we've you know that's the, even the strongest relationship is going to struggle with that uh, and then when he was painting sometimes he had his painter's block and he was you know grumpy because he couldn't paint and then he was painting it was all slow and he didn't want to be disturbed and he was quite laconic anyway so actually then maxfield parish had a very different life really Seemed to be, he was quite wealthy. He was very successful. So, so, so is this was this his style then? I don't know him really. So well, it, did he do a lot of this kind of work? Only more towards when he got to this. He started off with always illustrations in books, magazines, and then he got to this, and then I believe he got to some murals, which were really interesting. Okay, um, which. Uh, I haven't really, you've got, you've got to I mean, laugh at me this week with my notes. I've got so many notes. <laughs> i got so into this. I tell everybody that maybe because the news at the moment was so awful, but mm. I was just so happy to look at a painting this week. So what are in your notes that we haven't, that we haven't Only that. shared with our loyal audience? Because <laughs> we've done all this work. We've done all, I know. I really have done. Um... Well, I can see in one of your notes here. It says, studied architecture. Yeah, that was right at the beginning. The Haverford College, 1888 to 1890. Mm. Born into a Quaker family. <laughs> But yeah, Laura does work very hard on these. I, well, um, I do, but then what happens is I get too many notes, and then what happened last week, Phil? You asked me something, I couldn't even find what I was going to talk about. Well, it was even funnier. Here we go then. So, so oh, now this is interesting. <laughs> see, it's funny all these little circles intertwine. Yeah, so, see, I'm, I'm America to, Sat. I'm here to help. Well, America Sat film. We, we we filmed at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, and in fact, the Artist Garden. We filmed. Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, which is the oldest art gallery in the United States. And in 1892, our man, aged 22, studied there. Oh, there we go. There's a link. His father was an artist. There's the Stephen exhibition Parrish. on the uh, on screen link. Which so is that's uh, so obviously our recommendation for purchase <laughs> is the Artist Garden, American Impressionism, and Mary Cassatt. Um, I found my mural note, which is, I think, really lovely. And if anyone wants to look it up, 1906, he did a mural for the Knickerbocker Hotel in New York. Well, you'd stay there just for the name, wouldn't you? Yeah, you can't anymore. It's uh, not there. Uh, and the subject was old King Cole. And uh, he was paid $5,000 for it. The mm. hotel closed, 1930. And the picture is now at the St Regis Hotel. Okay. Have you ever been there? No. And it's now worth ten million. <laughs> so. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. But he's got another one in the San Francisco Palace Hotel as well. Another another mural. So he was he was he was quite something. Hmm. But you know, I think his style. I, I I really loved it. I love that it took me back to when I was a teenager. And then I sort of thought, and I thought it was funny how some people don't like to admit, do they? I was even a bit like, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to tell Phil about my wings of love. By uh, Isn't there a, 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 a swan's yeah. neck kind of <laughs> drooping down from the top of the picture? 
It is a bit. I mean, if anyone wants to look it up, that's up to them. I'm saying nothing. Well, he and then, but then I read in the, the reason I'm going to admit to it was that Wayne Hemingway actually owns it. Whether he still does, I don't know. And uh, I really like him. He's a fashion designer. Was did mm-hmm. Red or Dead. So I was like, well, if Wayne likes it, then that's no reason why you shouldn't like it. Yeah, but I think it's that time, it's that period. People mm. are always going to look back, aren't they, and think, what was the thing that we lived with all our lives? My mum and dad had, I mean, my mum was just loved to lose the trek. Mm. And that was always, but I had, to, I, I had something, I had to make my own decision. Which one was I going to put on my wall as a teenager? I'm not saying all teenagers were the ones, in, the one in fours, but there's something about this, this print that's mm. just given everyone that little fantasy, it's warm. It's it's just a pleasant. That's been funny though, going going into other people's houses and seeing the same print. Yeah. It's like, oh, I've got that. Yeah, so have I. Actually, next door neighbours. Oh yeah, Mrs. So and so. Imagine in an apartment block of three hundred apartments. Yeah. <laughs> and they're suggesting that what seventy five of them have got. Hey, I've got. No, so have I. Well, let's say they were all printed off in the right colours. <laughs> yeah, the same. Because other one would be like, well, hang on a minute, my, my one's a bit greener. <laughs> I'm just looking at your notes because there's oh, no, more. Don't. No, no, but there's more. His, so, 18, <laughs> he's doing posters in 1897 for Scribner's, the Century Magazine. Yeah, then he. Two years later, he's illustrated an edition for L. Frank Baum's Mother Goose in prose. Oh, he's done loads of books. He marries yes. Lydia Amber Austin and had four children. They moved to Cornish, New Hampshire with his family and he built his studio. Had TB in 1900. While recovering, learned how to mix oils and glazes and apply them in layers to create vibrant colours. That's the thing he was known yeah. for. But if you get to my note number eight, page number eight, because I've got I've got well, 13 where's, pages on him. Where's page three? Oh, I don't know, Phil, we've messed all this up. <laughs> but he did, it, he right, did a book called The Knave of Hearts, 1925, uh, yes. which was considered to be one of the most beautifully illustrated books ever published. So wow. there's another statement, isn't it? All these... These statements that people people mm. say. So, how do we, you know, how are we ever going to know? But one of the most beautiful books ever published. Is yeah, that, is, his illustrations were so wonderful. In the Knave of Hearts, nineteen twenty-five, the book was. So um, all those monastic Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, exactly. Right, <laughs> it's bold. It is bold. You sure it wasn't off eBay? Somebody's. This is the problem. When we were young, if we were doing this when we were younger and there's no internet, we go to the reference library every week. Yeah, well, you yeah. wouldn't because you've never made, you never have time, and we'd have to go and get all sorts of in books. But so here's here's a shocking thing. I went to I actually went to my uh, my local University of Sussex library, right? A few days ago. Okay. And I was taking back uh, two books on Hopper. Right. <laughs> and I went to the returns and I said, uh, I, I thought I'd better come in because I'd actually like to keep them out a bit longer. And uh, But I was I was a bit worried that, you know, obviously if there's somebody waiting for them, I need yeah. to bring them back. <laughs> she laughed. She said, these students won't want books on Hopper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And I thought, really? No, they want Maxfield Parish. <laughs> they want Maxfield Parish. <laughs> they I mean, want Parish. <laughs> I thought that was, and then I, I went in. I went to the part of the library that have, has all the library books, and you, you know, you look at them and last, you know, Daubigny or you know, there was a book I took out, you know, last borrowed like nineteen seventy eight. Oh, yeah. So it's you know, taste change, times change. Yeah, I just think I just think I, I mean, I love doing all the research for these podcasts, but I do worry sometimes. When I think, oh, have I? But that's what's actually nice because people are writing and saying to us, actually, this happened, that happened. Mm. And if they've got way more knowledge, it's actually really lovely. We're getting some more facts. But I'm really concerned that you've ju- you've jumped to page eight and I got through page two. Well, no, two. because only because I've muddled. I know, but where are pages three to look, seven? Seven's over the back of the sofa. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's in page seven then? We don't want to. Oh no! Come on, Phil. No, no. If there's good stuff, not necessarily because that was. Uh, all right, let me. No. Let me come. Can you? Like, why read out page seven? No. You find pages four <laughs> to six. No, because that, what happened last week? I was trying this to be really the, efficient with my notes. Will you just be more confident? After the Great War, <laughs> he was often on the cover of Life magazine. That's yeah, interesting. Yeah, really. My notes are always still in my multicolours. I've stuck with my 
original plans. Yeah. Now, you see, here you said this image is from 1923. Well, uh, I mean... I thought it was 1922. Two, yeah, it's, Okay. Yeah. Ah, but look. Yeah, sorry. It's a fantasy image created to be mass-produced mm. as a lithograph for oh. American homes. Right. Okay. So he actually did it on purpose. The best-selling print of the 20th century sold yeah. huge numbers. Okay, so it's actually was he was so it's not a painting that then is copied. No. It's actually made to yeah. be mass-produced. Now, if that's true, that's quite interesting because mm. he must have thought to himself What's... that is suggesting. What can I do which is going to be the most popular? Yeah. You know, what what is it that is going to do really well commercially, mass produced? And for some reason, yeah. Do you know that would make a really interesting film actually? Oh, here we go. No, but it would. Yeah. How does how does an artist create something which ends up as the most the highest selling print? Because then you're dealing with the importance of railroads and distribution and and who sold, how these pictures were bought and sold, and people's tastes, yeah. and the artist's brain thinking. What people really want is two Roman-looking columns, <laughs> a naked 11-year-old with a slightly, I think it's slightly, anyway. Um, yeah, the, the hair is, is odd. The hair is odd. Yeah, that's there's not, no, there's not no, my favourite hairstyle. There's no fluidity to it, is there? No. And then you've got somebody lying down with very red cheeks. Yeah. And then you've got this odd... Un- realistic, unrealistic background, and you've either got a, a, a pool of water which you wouldn't swim in for a million years because it's so green, or it's just a field of wheat or something. I don't know. So, yeah, what makes it? And but then, then, you, and, then yeah. a, and a tree of flowers. Mm. I mean, I've never seen it. I mean, I've never, it can't. It's not blossom. No, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, I'm, it is funny. It is odd. Well, then you need to make the film, Phil. Maybe you could include. Wings of Love in it as well, <laughs> with the swan. <laughs> because what made that so popular in yeah. the 70s? Wow. This is, the, you know, what made this so popular in the 20s. It is interesting. Well, I think I'd like to encourage, if anyone has this or their parents have this on the wall, mm. I'd like to hear. Oh. And let's see if one in four of our listeners... Yes, oh, that's going to be really good. Come through. And also, if people would like to put what they had or what they felt was on their walls. Yeah. What was I haven't asked you, Phil? What was on yours? <laughs> or are you not going to own up can't, to it? Can't remember a name <laughs> or the month. <laughs> okay, so you're not going <laughs> to. It was. Um, I had a montage of. St- I, I, I used to. I mean, I remember having an amazing photograph of these guys playing. Uh, wheelchair, um, volleyball, um, basketball, fantastic photograph. And then I had... And you haven't got that anymore. That uh, sounds brilliant. I had bands and... Yeah, uh, exactly. Cut out clippings and... Uh, yeah, me too. Maybe a f- football team picture. And I wish I had a photograph of it, actually. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to see. Mm. I wish I had a photo of mine. It's really taken me back this week. My brothers painted their room... I don't know how they got away with this. I don't know how. I mean, I really don't. They painted the walls and ceiling black. Mm. <laughs> and one of the things I remember was they would, they put a, a re, they didn't, they didn't particularly like a record. They put it in the oven to melt it. It's like a di- the old <laughs> disc. They had crisp packets as well. <laughs> so they had this melted, I, I remember coming home and they, they would like nailed this melted thing to the wall. <laughs> I used to look at them going, what are you <laughs> I say, what are mum and dad going to say? Yeah. So they had a That's very... That's actually really something if they didn't like the music. They had a very original kind of wall decoration. But more to the point, mm. what was quite interesting looking back, and as I said, um, these pictures went, my parent, went with my parents all their lives and I don't even think they really knew who they were. Somewhere along the way, they'd bought these impressionist prints. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, just just put them on the wall just for colour. You know? mm. um, there were certain pictures that you just people just as well that they had royal. I mean, other things they had photographs on the wall. They had royalty. My mum and dad had Tutankhamun on the wall. Tutankhamun. Yeah, and I've got it upstairs. Oh, really? I couldn't bear, I couldn't bear to part with it. Yeah, huh. a poster but, though. Yeah, huh. isn't that funny? My sister, I always remember this because I used to look at it a lot. She had a. Um, uh, it's it's in the National Gallery, a Leonardo 
um, Saint Anne drawing, um, and then also the Picasso man with guitar. Okay. Oh yeah. So she had she had works of art, prints, obviously, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I think as I grew up, I would have changed for sure. How long would it have been on my wall for? We did. How long do these one in four people keep theirs on their wall for? We did do an interesting series actually for uh, Channel Five, which was called High Five, mm. and we went to four major galleries in London, and we did the five. We made a film about the five top paintings, yeah, based on postcard sales. Oh, well, that sounds really good. And we kind of went, you know, five, four, three, yeah. two, one. And it was basically not on, not in terms of what we or the presenter thought is the best work, and but or the director, the institution would think was the best work. But what sold the most postcards? And that was interesting. Okay, I think that's available online to download or stream at sevenfiveandart.com. Well, if it isn't, you need to get it. <laughs> you need to get it on there next week. If there's enough demand, it'll be there. High five. And if not, then you've got to go and make the film now as well. Right. So, well, nothing to keep you occupied. <laughs> so that's that's Maxfield Parish and Daybreak. And we've talked about that for quite a long time. Yeah, so have, the actually. sun's going down. Yeah. I've got and, lights on all over the place now. And um, we'll see you next week. Mm. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.